I want to start with the word disruption. I always thought it was a scary buzzword, so I never really used it. But before coming here, I looked in the dictionary, and I realized that it means to interrupt and to drastically alter, to change. So I was like, okay, that's not that scary after all. So today I want to share with you some stories from my life, and hopefully, some of them I found disruption in. So, okay, the first story is about limitations. So, this was back when I was a teenager, and like every other teenager, I wanted to impress some girls. So, what do you do? You, I, I, I started to learn the guitar, <laughs> but I couldn't really learn it because I was very impatient. So, years later, I made this contraption which you wear on your hands, and what you see on your finger is this transducer, which gives you an illusion of push or pull. So you can imagine me now picking up a ukulele and downloading a song, downloading a song onto my hand and start playing without knowing how to play. <laughs> so the way it works is it first teaches you. Uh, and as you get better, uh, it will only correct you, so it will move your fingers to the right chord positions. And once you are really good at it, it will only misguide you so that you can explore and learn. So you can also imagine this as picking up a pen or a brush and being able to write in Chinese without knowing how to write in Chinese. So of course, I, I still wasn't able to impress any girls, they thought I was a nerd. <laughs> but disruptions can emerge from our limitations. My second story is about fantasies. From India, I moved to Singapore, and this is what I saw everywhere. People experiencing the city through this five-inch slab of glass. And where I grew up, I used to walk barefoot. Now, of course, these are some white man's legs, so you can imagine some brown legs. <laughs> that would be me. Uh, but I wanted to bring back this joy and beauty of experiencing the city with your feet by walking back into my city where I lived in. So I started working on super shoes. So these are silicon-based insoles which have three ticklers and one capacitive pad which can sense your taps. And there's some electronic shit. <laughs> and all of this is perfectly foldable, moldable, flexible, and stink-proof. And you can put this in any shoe, and any shoe becomes a super shoe. So the way this works is with a tickling interface. So the shoes tickle you. If the right feet tickle, take a right turn. If the left feet tickle, take a left turn. If no tickle, keep going. And if all tickles, stop. <laughs> so of course, uh, I also added a personality engine to it, where you can tell the shoes what kind of food you like, music you like, places you like, your social preferences, and so on. And it knows where you are, knows your calendar, knows your tasks. So of course, the first thing is navigation, you know, taking you from one place to the other by tickling your feet. Or even because it knows what kind of food and drinks I like. Like, for example, this is my first time in Klagenfurt. You guys are amazing. So I really love schnapps. And <laughs> so, the so now the shoes know. The shoes know that I love schnapps, so they will tickle me and take me to a really good schnapps place in Klagenfurt. <laughs> they also remind me, for example, if I want to pick up wine on the way back home, they'll remind me and I can pick it up. But more than all of that, I think, I really think, the art of getting lost, the art of getting lost is lost nowadays. We don't get lost anymore, you know? We always know where we are. So now with the shoes, what you can do is, you can walk anywhere you want, get lost, and when you want to come back home, you just tap your feet thrice and the shoes take you back home. So the shoes will be released soon in the market. I think what I learned from here was disruptions are about pulling reality 
one step closer to your fantasies and imagination. My third story is about simple solutions. So from Singapore, I moved to Phnom Penh in Cambodia, and where I lived, there was this e-waste landfill close by with keyboards, mouse, and old computers thrown from all over the world. And families and kids worked here. And these kids used to make toys from trash. You know, they used to use the computer cables and ethernet wires to jump skip rope and use all sorts of things to make their own toys. So, and most of these kids didn't go to school. So I started also making toys. Um, so I started making fun educational toys from trash. So the way this works is, what do you see at the top, the small box? That is something you put in your pocket. It's, it's that small, and this is the first version, by the way. And you can carry it and walk to the landfill, pick up a keyboard, plug it in, and the keyboard now becomes a piano, so you can play music. Uh, this one is made from an old calculator screen, and it asks you random mathematical questions. Now, no kid ever likes this toy. <laughs> uh, or this one, where it tells you stories. And these were the first three prototypes, and which later became smaller and smaller. And these, there were a number of these toys, and it led to this NGO called Open Toys, where we had a lot of educators, designers, community activists, uh, engineers, who came together and made these toys, and we got these toys to about more than two, 3,000 kids in Phnom Penh, in Thailand, in Brazil. I think what I learned here was disruption can sometimes be about simple solutions to big problems, solutions that are not so obvious, but they just seem right after you do it. So, from Phnom Penh, I moved to Tokyo, where I started making futuristic sex toys. Now, don't ask me why I started making sex toys from children's toys, because whatever I say will sound wrong. <laughs> and if you want to hear my story, I can tell you that at the after party. <laughs> but I can definitely tell you what I learned, that disruptions can be quite fun. <laughs> so from, from Tokyo, I moved to Cambridge. This is my house in Cambridge. And I was walking back to my house, and one night, I got robbed by this really tall, muscular guy. He took my wallet, my money, my phone. And I was so afraid, I didn't go home the next day. And the week after, I took a taxi to go home. Because as you can see, I don't have any muscles. <laughs> so um, I was really scared. So I went to my lab, and I got some thermoplastics. And I started making some synthetic muscles. So, these are super thin and flexible and foldable, and they're very soft. And I added this pneumatic engine at the back. So the way, so the way you wear it is you wear it under your shirt. <laughs> and uh, you can activate it by flexing your muscles. So as a demonstration, uh, you can see that my left... <laughs> you can see my left arm has more muscles than my right arm, or my right arm has no muscles at all, and that's the synthetic muscles. Um, but this got me interested into body API and body mutation. So the other thing I really was frustrated about was my hair. You know, like, there are all those amazing, handsome guys in magazines and have, have amazing hair, and somehow you can never look like that. So imagine what if you could take your phone and snap a picture of someone's face, the hairstyle in a magazine or a real person, and your hair can automatically move and you can get that hairstyle. So I started making programmable hair. Um, so this was the first prototype. <laughs> and also the last prototype, because the, the circuit caught on fire. <laughs> and uh, my friend lost some hair and I lost a friend. <laughs> But at least with the muscles, when I went home now, everyone thought that I was the one who'd robbed them. <laughs> so disruptions can emerge from fear. All of us have fear. But only if you're comfortable with fear, if you can accept the fear. So from Cambridge, I moved to MIT in Boston, where I was a scientist. And one night, I got really drunk. And then I went to the water cooler to cool myself off. 
and I poured a huge glass of water and I drank it in one gulp. And the guy next to me started laughing. And I was like, why are you laughing? And he's like, you know, someone replaced the water in the water cooler with gin and tonic. <laughs> so the next thing I remember is I woke up in the hospital next morning. So again, I'm not a drunk guy, you know. You can, you can find it for yourself later in the party. But I really don't drink that much. But I was so terrified about this behavior of mine that I really wanted to see how can I change that in a fun way. So I still wanted to be drinking because, of course, uh, quitting alcohol is not an option. So I started going to bars and observing people, how they drink and uh, how much they drink and what do they do to uh, you know, control themselves or have fun. Um, so I started making these ice cubes. So I made these ice cubes. So uh, it basically has some electronic shit which can monitor how much you drink and how fast you drink. And it is encased in this food safe, drink safe jelly, which you can then put in a refrigerator and make ice cubes out of. And these ice cubes also respond to sound, as you can see here. So imagine the party floor, you know, the music pumping. So the ice cubes also change their intensity according to that. So it's not like you're a dork having ice cubes, but you're like this fun guy or, you know, having fun with this party. So the way it works is uh, when you start drinking, so of course you can set your limit and your age and all of that on the app, accompanying app. But the way it works is when you start drinking, the cubes are green in color, okay? As you drink more, they become orange. And as you drink even more, they turn red. And if you still don't stop drinking, they will send a message to your emergency contact <laughs> with your GPS location, asking them asking them to pick you up. So, yeah, I think I learned that disruptions can be found in our habits and behaviors. All of us have our own habits that we want to change. And you, this is where you can find the opportunity for disruption and make your, design your own life in a way. So, my next story is about frustrations that you find in the present. So I remember this one day when I was packing my bag to go to the lab, and I just had this look in my bag, and I was like, okay, I have a laptop, I have a tablet, I have a phone, and they all three do the exact, more or less the exact same thing, you know? And why am I carrying three devices? Just because they're three different sizes. Doesn't make sense. So I had this crazy idea back then, which I still think is it's slightly crazy, but... Uh, the idea was, can I take a phone, can I take an iPhone and stretch it, you know, like a rubber band, like stretch it, and it becomes a tablet. And maybe I stretch it even more and it becomes a MacBook. Uh, because by the way, they all do the same thing anyways, you know. So I started making these elastic screens. So this is an elastic computer whose screen can be pushed, pulled, compressed, expanded, warped, uh, it can detect friction, but more importantly, it is a 2.5D screen, which means it also remembers shapes. So it's not just two-dimensional, it's 2.5-dimensional. So you can actually pull out shapes and it will remember the shapes. So let's take an example. So uh, in this case, we have a terrain, we have a surface here, and I can push down to see the soil and water information. I can pull up to see the air information. I can even pull and push simultaneously and stitch it together to see both soil and air together. I can, like I said, the shape memory, so you can also pull up a mountain and it'll actually remain there. And you can then look inside the mountain. It also acts as a touch screen. So you can also maybe draw rivers if you want. And you can then change the shape, size of the river by compressing, expanding. And if you really want, you can also pull the entire surface, the entire screen up. You can pull the screen up, like elastic, and then you can see the soil layers underneath. 
So, I think my dream of having the phone to stretch to an iPad, to a computer, is almost there. It's, it's, it's almost there. Maybe I'll come to TEDx Klagenfurt next year and I'll, I'll, I'll show you that. But I think what I learned here is disruptions are best found in our frustrations with the present. All of us have something that we're going through today that we're like, this is wrong, this should not be like this. But let's change it, you know, let's, let's, let's change that. So my last story for today, my last story for today is about eyes. And this story is actually my first story because it happens when I was 14 year old. So it is actually the first thing I ever made. So I was smoking a cigarette back then in my university in a no smoking area and my professor caught me smoking and as a punishment he told me to pick up all the cigarette butts that were lying down on the soil. So it took me one hour to pick up all those smelly, stinking butts all across the ground. And somehow, I, okay, and then somehow, I don't even remember what happened, but I had this idea of, what if I put a seed, a plant seed, in the butt of the cigarette? So now, when you smoke your cigarette and you throw your butt, you're actually planting a tree. So this is uh, grass growing from about four packs of cigarette butts. <laughs> um, so I guess my biggest learning was that a smoker can make the world more greener than a non-smoker, one tree at a time. <laughs> but no, 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 no. Uh, I think what I learned was disruptions don't need technology. You know, they don't need technology. They just need eyes. So. I'm gonna close out by saying that apart from these seven things I learned that I shared with you today, I want to put one last one out there, which is going back to what we started with, the meaning of disruption. If you look at disruption, which is interruption of a system of an event, or drastically altering something, or doing some change, that is the core essence of life. We take something that's been given to us and then all of us shape it, we touch it, we interrupt it, we disrupt it with our own experiences in a small way or a big way, it doesn't matter. For me, it was technology and design, for you it is journalism, maybe it is poetry, maybe it's sports, but you use that to disrupt what you have and then you share it, you pass it on to the next generation. So, Disrupt is you. Thank you.